So hello everyone. Uh, let's talk about breaking black box machine learning. I think today you have seen a couple of talks that mentioned various machine learning libraries, etc., and how easy it is to use them. So I'm here to convince you that some of these things are actually, we should be careful about using some of these things. So first, something about me. Well, I'm in Poland, so I can be brave and put in my diacritics. It usually freaks uh, English speakers. Uh, so I'm Evelina Gabashova. I come from Prague originally. I live in London and I work uh, in the Alan Turing Institute, which is the British National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. I am part of the research engineering group. Uh, I'm also part of the F Sharp community. I'm a Microsoft MVP, but I work as a data scientist. And what I want to talk to you about is the state of machine learning right now. Because everyone talks about machine learning, everyone talks about AI, everyone talks about data science. And there are all these amazing libraries that you can use, just a random selection. Uh, you can do TensorFlow, you can do Keras, you can do PyTorch, everything basically is implemented. Uh, Scikit-learn, any algorithm you want to use in machine learning turns out to be a one-liner in the appropriate library. So nice, you can go and just do whatever you want with machine learning. Uh, there are also various machine learning APIs like Google Prediction, Amazon Machine Learning, Microsoft Cognitive Services. You, can, you don't even have to write the one-liner. You can just call a service that will give you the right answer. So no mathematics needed. I can throw away my PhD. This is just a photo from a random book that I took in my office that was behind me, opened it at a random page. This is what, you know, what you had to do like 10 years ago when you wanted to do machine learning. But now you don't need it anymore, which is great. And I like to use the analogy of a compiler because we are all programmers, we all write programs, but we don't actually have to know how a compiler works underneath. We don't have to care like what the lexer is doing. We don't have to care about the tokenizer. We don't have to deal with the parser. We don't have to manipulate the ASDs unless we are doing some deep compiler stuff. So we don't care what the compiler does as long as it compiles our program. But with machine learning, we are not there yet. And for me, machine learning and software development are very, very closely related. In both, you write some algorithms, you run them, sometimes they fail because you have a bug somewhere. But with machine learning, the additional danger is that it can fail silently. And without actually looking at, carefully looking at what you have done and what are the results and what data you are using, it can go horribly wrong. So, my talk is about black box machine learning. So, this will be the rules that I will follow. I will try to use several algorithms just out of the box with minimal setup. I will keep mathematics at a minimum. And let's just observe when things go wrong. And I'll be looking at several algorithms. Uh, everything starts with linear regression. Some people argue if you can call linear regression AI. If you are selling it to someone, yes, you can call it AI. Uh, then I'll look at decision trees and finally vision de deep learning. And everything will be with live demos, hopefully. So let's go into linear regression. Linear regression is one of the most basic algorithms. It's very well understood, but it's very widely used. It's very nice because you can actually understand what's happening if you are looking at the mathematical properties, etc. Simply, it's trying to fit a linear function as a combination of your input data. This is a two-dimensional example. It's just trying to fit a linear function to my x values to predict uh, y, the vertical axis. So far, so good. So, let's look at some demo. And I don't want to deceive anyone. I don't want to show you things that I sort of pre-computed and it just magically works or doesn't work. So I'll be showing everything in Jupyter Notebooks. So this is a Jupyter Notebook. I'll just make it into a presentation, but it's still the same Jupyter Notebook underneath. I'll just execute things as we go along. 
And I'll be also using a mixture of languages because, of course, if you work with data and data science, you use R, you use Python, you use anything you want, you use JavaScript, whatever you want. So this example is in R. So this is just some setup, loading some libraries. And I'm using R because that's sort of the most traditional statistical language. So everyone does uh, things like linear regression in R because there are nice libraries to do that. It basically explains everything to you. And I think R is basically like a DSL for doing statistics. So let's try linear regression in R. And first of all, I will simulate some data. So this is the plot of the data that I have. I basically simulated random noise that's normally distributed around zero. I apologize, this linear regression section is one that contains the most actual mathematics. So, sorry. Uh, so this is linear regression. And what I will be trying to do, I will be trying to use my x value to predict the y value. And since I just generated random noise, it shouldn't do a good job, right? Hopefully. So how do we analyze that? Well, this is how you fit linear regression in R. You call a function called LM, which stands for linear model. And you say, I want to predict Y given X. And it's basically trying to fit this function. It's trying to predict the uh, compute the value of A and B so that this holds. So this is the result. So this looks fairly complicated. This is what R gives you as a result of a linear regression model. But I'll, I'll be looking at two specific numbers. One is the p-value here. If you look at any medical literature, etc., they always look at the p-value. So the p-value in this uh, context means, it means the probability that the results I'm getting here are caused by chance. So the smaller it is, the better, the more valid my model is. So here you can see the p-value is basically 90%, which means my results here are most likely caused by chance, which is what I would expect because I generated them randomly. And the second value I'll be looking at is the R squared coefficient here, which is also in percentage. And that one tells me how much variance in the data I can explain with my model. If I can explain 100% of the variance in my data through the model, it's doing a perfect job. Here I can explain basically zero variance, which means it's random, it doesn't tell me anything. So, so far so good. I expected that because I generated the data at random. So what I'm doing here, I'm adding one data point. Remember before the data were centered around zero, I'm adding a data point that's at location 100, 100. So these are the data I used before. This is the one single data point that I added right now. Let's see what happens with my linear regression. So I'm using the new data. I'm predicting exactly the same thing. Let's run it. And let's look at the same values as we looked at before. So the p-value, before it was basically 100%. Uh, right now, it's very, very small. This means this model is not random at all. It's significant. Amazing, I can publish it if I was doing anything medical. And I can explain with this model 98% of the variance in my data. It's doing a perfect job because I added one data point that's uh, called an outlier because it's somewhere else than the rest of the data. And this single data point completely changes the entire prediction. Well, now I might be saying, okay, this is just like a toy example that doesn't mean anything. Well, I have another example here, which is from a data sharing scheme in Washington, DC. And these are the data, this is just an overview. Uh, they were running a trial across two years, 2011, 2012. And for each day, they recorded uh, what was the season, 
if it was the first year or second year when it ran, what was the month, was it a holiday or was it a normal day, was it a weekday, was it a working day, what was the weather situation, what was the temperature, what was uh, humidity, wind speed, and how many people actually borrowed a bike, which is the CNT here, that stands for count. So let's run a very basic linear regression on this data set. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to predict how many people uh, borrowed a bike based on the temperature, based on the weather situation, based on the weekday, if it's a weekday or a weekend, and the season and the year. Sounds fine. Let's see how well we are doing. So first, p-value is very, very small, which means this is significant. The model is actually predicting something reasonable. Nice. And my r squared is 80%. That means I can just, with this very simple model, where I look at temperature and humidity and season, I can predict how many people will uh, borrow a bike, uh, and I'll be able to predict basically 80% of the variance in the data. It's doing a pretty good job. So let's add another data point. And I'm adding my data points here sort of artificially, but this can happen anytime someone is trying to transcribe the data from some record sheet and they mess something up. This happens in practice all the time. So I'm thinking, okay, it's from the US, the temperature is in Fahrenheit, so let's add uh, another row into the data set that will be the copy of the first row but the temperature will be 100, because it's obviously it must be in Fahrenheit, right? So it's basically almost the same data, just the temperature is different. Let's, let's rerun the same model. And if you remember the values we had before, the p-value is still significant, so nothing looks weird. But our r-squared value, that quantifies how well is my model performing, dropped by 7%. So just by adding one single data point into a 700 uh, data points that are sort of holding the signal, I suddenly lost 7% of my performance. But if I was dealing with this data set without knowing that, I would be completely lost. And the reason is that the data are not in Fahrenheit, the data were standardized into zero, one range where zero was something like minus 32 Fahrenheit and uh, one was 120. So, just by ignoring what happened with the data, I'm completely lost. So this was sort of a teaser. This is linear regression, and this is very well understood. And if you look at Wikipedia, it tells you, okay, of course, you can use linear regression only on data set that follow certain rules that have certain statistical properties, like weak exogeneity, homoscedasticity, and lack of perfect multicollinearity. These are the assumptions. Do you go and check some of these things? Like, I'm a statistician, I know what they mean, but I, I have a PhD to know that. But I don't expect anyone else to know what does a homoscedasticity mean. And some of these assumptions were violated in the data that I created. And of course, it's well understood, but if you use linear regression as a black box, you can get into trouble. Let's move on to decision trees. So decision trees are usually sort of the algorithm of choice for data sets that you don't understand. Uh, they win Kaggle competitions, it's the basis of random forests, it's an amazing algorithm. Uh, I don't want to go that much into how they work practically, but let's look at my next uh, notebook. So, if you are learning any kind of machine learning, you always start with the Titanic data set. And that's the sort of standard data set to sort of show off decision trees. So, I'm doing Python here, because why not? So, I'm just loading NumPy and Pandas and Scikit-learn and just reading the data into a Pandas data frame. And this is an overview of my data. So, 
this data set is basically to predict who survived Titanic and who died. And you get the passenger class, you get the name, you had the sex, you get the age, number of siblings, parents traveling with them, how much they paid for their cabin, if they traveled in a cabin or not, where they embarked, uh, and various, I think that's basically almost all. And you get the name, so you can infer some things from the name as well. And as I said, I want to use it as a black box. So what I'm doing here, I'm actually recoding some of the various variables into a numerical score. So now I'm having an array. It's not important. <laughs> I want to use a decision tree classifier as a black box. So I'll just create a decision tree on my data, give it everything. I have a model. And this is the result. This is my decision tree. And it looks very reasonable. For people who don't know about decision trees, um, Let's get the pointer again. They basically create a uh, sort of almost a rule-based system where in every node you have something that you are checking and if it's true, you go in one way. If it's false, you go the other way. So in this case, I recoded uh, sex to zero and one. If you are a male, you are a zero. If you are a female, you are one. So my first node here is checking if the numerical sex is lower than 0 0.5. That means if someone is male, you go into this direction. If someone is a female, you go in this direction. And if, if the node is orange, that's the negative class. That means the person died, if, or that class of people died. If it's blue, that means they survived, mostly. So unfortunately, it looks like that if you are a male, the only way to survive on Titanic was to be younger than 6.5 and have a few siblings. <laughs> <laughs> so then you get into this class that survived. But uh, for example, if you are a female, if you are from a lower class, then you probably, well, you survived as well. And here, like it, it's picking up fairly random things as well, like fair, if you, how much you paid, and if you paid more, you died, but there are 23 samples. It's a bit messy, but it fairly reasonably predicts uh, if you survived the Titanic or not, because it constructs this decision tree where it's fairly easy to look at. You can understand what's going on. You don't have to understand how it splits uh, the nodes, how it selects which node to split at which level. Uh, but you can look at the result and it makes sense. You can read it and it makes sense. And that's one of the selling points of decision trees. Whenever you look at some presentation on decision trees, whenever you look at something about machine learning, they always say that decision trees are easy to interpret. And this just frustrates me so much. And I will try to convince you that they are not interpretable. Let's look at a simple example that I constructed. So this is, again, almost the same thing. I'm just loading NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn. And here I'm constructing my training data. And it will be easier to see when I actually plot them. This is just plotting. This is ugly, but it's just plotting. So I created a matrix where if x plus y is larger than 1, actually the origin is there in the upper corner, then it's one class. If it's smaller than 1, then it's the other class. So it's just a combination of two values, and it's a fairly simple rule if you look here. So if uh, I sum them and they are uh, sort of smaller than 100, etc then it's zero. If it's larger than 100, then it's one. Uh, all right. So let's try to fit a decision tree to something like this. Nice, it worked. And this is how it looks when you visualize that. This is a decision tree you get on two variables and two classes with a very simple rule that was used to generate the data. It's huge. And the reason is that decision trees are basically just trying to bisect everything 
perpendicular to the data, to the features. So here it's just trying to make as many boxes as possible so that it can identify the boundary between the classes as well as possible. And I mean, you look at this. This is not identify interpretable. This is not identifiable. What do we do with this? And again, you must say, OK, this is just a pathological example. But I actually asked my colleague who, uh, when she was joining our team, this was part of her interview. This is stuff that she prepared for her interview. Uh, when she ran it on some Kaggle data set, Kaggle does machine learning competitions. It's not that important what happened, what data set uh, was that. It was sort of evaluating projects at schools. And she did a very good job. She really understood how it works. She uh, analyzed everything, looked at performance, etc. And she wanted to make a point that the result is interpretable. So if we make it larger, this is how it looked. So she decided not to include this plot in the interview. <laughs> but then once she was safely hired, she told me, and this is the resulting uh, decision tree that has a reasonable performance, but don't tell me this is interpretable. Sorry, this is my frustration coming out because, well, this talk was partly born out of me being frustrated by people saying incorrect things about various algorithms. So let's go back to my slides. So you look at Wikipedia, you look at decision trees, and under advantages and disadvantages, the main advantage is that they are simple to understand and interpret. Sorry, I'm silently screaming on a big screen. <laughs> this is not simple to interpret, and this happens in practice all the time. And this is one of the simplest algorithms you can use, actually. Okay, let's do something that's even more fun. Zero mathematics in this section. Let's look at deep learning. Because a lot of companies are now trying to sell everyone their deep learning libraries, their deep learning systems. Uh, for example, I'll be uh, using um, Azure Cognitive Services. It's basically a coincidence because I have access to Azure credits. I could be using any of the other services as well. It will be the same or very similar. I might get different results, but the principle is exactly the same. So how does it work? In this section, I'm using F-sharp because I can. Uh, yeah, this, this thing is there, so. Uh, but the code is not important. What I'm really doing here is I'm just calling their cognitive API version two to analyze a picture. This is a fairly ugly function to actually call it and get a picture description out of a JSON. And this is how it works. And as I said, I don't want to fake anything. Uh, so you can see that it's the same image here in the markdown and it's the same image that I'm passing to the function. So let's try it on a guitar because we had a sort of uh, rock theme going on throughout this conference. So this is a acoustic guitar, but still. And Azure Cognitive Services are telling me this is a close up of a guitar. I can't argue with that. So that's the description of the image and the list of things underneath are tags that get assigned to that image. So okay, so it's music, guitar, musical instruments, string instrument, building material. Not so sure, lumber, bass. Okay, I think this works well enough. I'm pretty happy with this. Let's try a monkey. And this is a monkey sitting on a table. And again, all the tags are related to the monkey, mostly. I'm not a, an expert on monkeys, so I'm not sure if it's an old world monkey or a new world monkey, etc. But it looks fairly reasonable to me. 
So let's try another monkey. Uh, and it's a monkey sitting on a branch. Even better than the previous one. The previous one was apparently sitting on a table. Now it's sitting on a branch. Nice. I'm pretty happy with that. Let's put it into production. Let's use it for something, etc. Well, the typical thing to do in machine learning is that, okay, well, algorithms probably won't handle well things that were not in their training set. So let's try something crazy. This looks very disturbing to a person. You try, this is a word that I invented. It's basically like a smiling seal. <laughs> and it's telling me it's a close up of a fish. And it identified that there, are gra there is grass, it's outdoor, there's an animal, there are eyes, there's fish, there's a face, and it's fairly close. Okay, it's not perfect, but I'm not sure why it didn't identify the fact that there are teeth in there, but I would say it's fairly okay. It hasn't seen anything like this before. I hope none of us will see anything like this before or at any point, but it did a fairly good job. Like, I mean, if I looked at it, I can say, okay, it might be a close-up of a fish with very weird teeth. So, so far so good, I would say. So let's try to modify the pictures a little. Let's give the monkey a guitar. And this is still fine. Monkey holding a guitar, okay. Hmm. Let's give guitar to the other monkey. And suddenly it's a dog looking at the camera. It did find the guitar in there, it's in the tags, but yeah. Well, the reason is that in the training set, the dogs were probably near guitars more often than monkeys. So there is a fairy thing with a guitar, it must be a dog. So let's try hovering the guitar next to the monkey. Because before this, uh, when the monkey was actually close to the guitar, it told me, okay, uh, it's a monkey holding a guitar. But let's try this one. <laughs> it's a monkey holding a dog. I was considering uh, sort of moving around the guitar to find the precise moment when the guitar turns into a dog. And you can see that it didn't identify the guitar there at all, which is slightly disturbing. But this is a fairly surreal image. So, well, the problem is what does the network really see when it looks at an image like this? Let's try something else. Let's try a nice landscape like this. And it's a herd of sheep grazing on a lush green hillside. Can you see any sheep? The problem is that in the training set, it quite often saw this kind of landscape with sheep in it because there are no trees, there is green, it's in the mountains somewhere. So it sees sheep where, well, there are none because it's, it's basically just looking at the texture. It doesn't recognize sheep because they have four legs and uh, they have white fur and they are sort of standing on the grass and not flying in the air. It recognizes sheep by texture and the texture in this image is very similar to texture of an image where sheep are actually grazing on the grass. Well. Almost the final one. Let's try something like this. Just let's try to give it something that it hasn't seen before, definitely. And it's a monkey sitting on a branch. And it gave me exactly the same description that I had when the monkey was there alone. Oh, I think they are ignoring the giraffe in the room. Maybe I should have used an elephant. So, you can see how the network just ignores things that are not expected to be there. And this is fairly close to, very, well, this is a very surreal image. So let's try actual surreal image. This is from Magritte, a famous painting called The Son of Man. 
And the description I'm getting from the uh, network, from the API, is it's a man wearing a suit and hat. And nowhere in the list of tags that it assigned to the image is an apple. Because in the same way, before the neural network behind all this didn't see the giraffe, now it doesn't see the apple because it's not expecting an apple to be there. And for network, this is no different from an actual image of just a person standing there in a suit and a hat. So you can very easily break these things just by giving them something that it's not expecting in an unexpected context. Not like completely unexpected because the, the smiling creature that I was showing looked fairly similar. It was on a grass. It looked fairly normal. So just put things into a different context and it's lost. And this is a production system. There are systems that are depending on these cognitive services. You can use them to authenticate into your laptop, for example. So does that scare anyone? So let's go back to my slides. And the thing is, you, as I said, these networks see only things that they are trained to see. But if they appear in a different context, they are just completely lost. You can see quite a lot of, uh, of news articles like this where like someone printed, created something that you just hang around your neck and then surveillance doesn't see you. These things are actually quite hard to come up with because you need access to the network that you are creating this kind of attack against. You have to query it. You can't create something like this that works on any image recognition system. So we are not there yet that sort of protesters could print something and hide uh, from the government. But maybe if you want to hide something, not yourself, but something, maybe just put an apple in front of your face and no one will recognize you because all the systems will think you are just a normal person. The thing is, really, these systems look at textures, then don't look at, they don't have a concept of actual things, how things look. This is an example uh, of a Google system that uh, Android phones have where uh, if you take multiple photos in the same location, it will offer to create a panorama for you by putting the images together. And this is the result you might get. <laughs> because that uh, image recognition system behind this doesn't care. It looks like a mountain. OK, boom, a mountain. And if that doesn't scare you enough, because that's just fun, these things are used in medicine. This is an example of a paper that came out almost a year ago, where they were looking at how, uh, well, right now doing image recognition on medical images is a very popular thing to do. A lot of companies are jumping into that. And in this paper, they were looking at how well do results from one hospital transfer to another hospital. And they found it's completely hopeless. You train a system on data from one hospital, you transfer it to another hospital, and the performance just drops. So they were looking at why. Why does something like that happen? And in this study, they were predicting if a person has pneumonia from an x-ray. And they looked at, well, right now you can analyze uh, deep learning uh, networks to see where they are looking at when they are making a decision. So this is what they got. The network was looking at, at the right corner. That's nowhere near where the lungs are. It shouldn't be making decisions based on the right hand corner when there are no lungs. So what was it looking at? It was looking at a small metal tag that the technicians put on people uh, that go under the mobile x-ray. Because if you are so sick that you can't physically move to the location where the big x-ray is located, they come with a mobile x-ray, they put a metal tag on your shoulder and they put you through that. And that indicates you, are probably, you probably have pneumonia because you are so sick that you can't move. And the neural networks pick up on that because these are sort of just artifacts of data collection. Another example that came out last uh, month, this one is even more scary because in this case they were looking at 
a medical system that got approved in the European Union to actually diagnose people to classify their sort of skin marks if they are malignant or benign. And these researchers, what they did is they looked at, uh, uh, they took the data and they created artificial surgical marks around uh, possible tumors. Uh, and the thing is, if you have a surgical mark around it, that means a doctor is probably taking a picture before extracting it. So they made these little marks uh, or they uh, zoomed in on sort of some smaller marks. And any time there was a surgical mark around it, the system it's, that's currently sort of approved to be used by clinicians for diagnosis immediately classified that as malignant. You really don't want to have these things out there in practice. I mean, this scares me truly, because this is just an artifact of data collection. And it all boils down to data. Uh, the thing is, well, the sort of uncomfortable truth of data science or machine learning is that 90% of data science is data wrangling and 10% is complaining about data wrangling. Because if you just want to run a model, then it's a one-liner from one of the libraries. And I have another example of sort of data problem. Uh, this one, there was an article about two years ago, developers who use spaces make more money than those who use tabs. Mm. Well, of course, it got on the hacker news, it got into mainstream media like BBC. Programmers who use spaces are paid more. Hmm, what was happening there? Well, I uh, wrote a blog post about that, but if you looked at the data, it looks normal. I mean, they, the guys who came up with this relationship, they published the data, they published the methods they used, they were very transparent about what they did. So you could rerun it on your computer, get the same results. And the thing is, it holds across all experience levels. So the number of years someone coded as part of their job versus their median annual salary, perfect relation. If you are using spaces, you are paid more. The thing is, I was looking at the data because I thought, okay, this, something is not right here, something is happening there. And one of the things I discovered was, I just plotted the salary data that they used in that plot. And this is a histogram so every bar tells me how many people are in that bracket. And you might notice that they're around zero. Like, what's this? There are quite a lot of people who are paid basically zero. This is weird. And any person working with data should zoom in on something like this. So let's look at who is in that bracket that makes basically zero. These are developers who report annual salary lower than $3,000. That's $250 per month. That's weird. So India, okay, maybe. Like, India is not a rich country, so maybe. But the second one is Poland. Hey, come on, guys. How much do you earn? <laughs> I think more than $3,000 a year. So I looked at salary distributions. These are salary distributions from some of the normal countries. And you can see that they have sort of one big bump somewhere, otherwise they look fairly normal. Normal with lowercase n. And these are salary distributions from countries from Central and Eastern Europe. They look different. They have this weird bump at the beginning. So it's uh, Germany, there is a little bump in, in there. Uh, Russia, the bump is really large. It's basically most people are paid very small amounts of money. And in Poland, it's sort of in between. Can anyone guess what was happening there? Yes. Monthly yes, monthly and yearly uh, data. Because the thing is, in the US, in the UK, everyone talks about yearly annual salary. But, well, I'm from Prague, so I have some cultural knowledge. And in the Czech Republic, everyone talks about their monthly salary. When you are negotiating about the salary, you always talk about monthly salary. 
So I, s I asked my friends in Poland, they confirmed it's the same in Poland. So this was the question that was asked. It, it, data from, uh, come from the annual survey that Stack Overflow does. And this was the question that was asked. They asked, what is your current annual underlined salary? Well, of course, people ignore that. So this is the distribution in Poland. And if you fit a mixture model to this to identify where the smaller bump is centered and multiply it by 12, you get a normal sort of expected salary distribution. I'm not saying this is right because the data are sort of just collected as an online questionnaire. There are not that many people responding to this. But that's definitely a sort of big mistake in the data. And when I alerted the authors of the original article that they have problems in their data like this, they said, well, but we asked for annual salary. <laughs> I think right now they acknowledged that it was actually wrong, and now they are asking the question differently. They are asking for a number, value of your salary, and then you have to tick if it's an annual or a monthly salary or a weekly salary, or you can choose. So they learned. But the thing is, without someone looking at the data fairly closely, you don't know if there are any problems like this. And this can mess up, for example, your linear regression, because, precisely because it's an outlier that doesn't fit with the rest of the data. And I hope I convinced you in the beginning that uh, linear regression can be completely messed up just by one outlier. And of course, they were fitting a linear regression somewhere. So. Machine learning can seem like magic, but it's not magic. And the thing is, it works in the same way as computers do anyway. Uh, I mean, like last time when you debugged something, I'm sure you were sort of angry at the computer because the computer was doing exactly what you told it to do. That's what, yeah, bugs mean. But the machine learning, it learns exactly what you tell it to learn. So if you give it data that have biases, if you give it data that don't make sense, it will try as hard as possible to learn that kind of data. Uh, an example, this is a sort of research or like a demonstration from MIT Media Lab, where they tried to train an AI to tag photos, and the training data they used were the most gruesome things from the dark corners of Reddit. So they created, they call it Norman, world's first psychopath AI. And they have some examples where they gave uh, like a standard image recognition software, an image like this, just a, like a Rorschach test. Uh, so standard AI sees a black and white photo of a small bird. Norman sees man gets pulled into dough machine. Another example, yeah, a person is holding an umbrella in the air, or a man is shot dead in front of his screaming wife. But the thing is, these things, they just learn from the data we give them. It's as simple as that. So whatever biased data we give it, it learns our biases from them. It learns all the mistakes that are in the data. So. If you are using black box machine learning, the real conclusion from this is you have to be paranoid about the data that it was used to train the original system. Uh, I'm not afraid of AI taking over. I'm not afraid of general AI um, sort of wiping up humanity. What I'm afraid of is people using current AI algorithms without understanding what they are doing. To, do, uh, to use all these biased data, biased algorithms to make policy decisions about actual humans. Because these things don't deal well with corner cases. And we all are a corner case in some kind of sense uh, anytime. We ask for a loan, it gets put, put into some machine learning system that pops out, okay, we are approved or not. But if we don't fit neatly into the brackets that are in the system, well, no one knows what the system will do. So whenever you want to uh, try some sort of black box machine learning system, you should really ask people who trained it, 
Like, where are, do the training data come from? For example, the Azure Cognitive Services, at some point, their image recognition system was very much biased towards giraffes. It used to see giraffes everywhere. Now they fixed it because they probably retrained it, etc. But it was biased in a funny way, but it can be biased in other ways as well that we don't really see. Uh, you should ask how people pre-process the data if they looked at outliers and if the, you, if the answer is there are no outliers in our data, that's probably wrong. Uh, what are the biases in the data? The data are always biased, so it's only about finding out if you are okay with the biases that are in the data or not. Uh, are the real world data different from the training data? Because you saw when I was calling the Azure Cognitive Services, it very much depended on things that are normal in our current world. Uh, because if when it saw something slightly different, then it was lost. So if the real data that you are using it on are slightly different from the data it was trained on, well, you don't know what's going to happen. And lastly, is your model really doing what you think it's doing? Really? Really? So. I think my main conclusion from this talk for you is just be careful. Whenever you use any kind of black box, whenever you call a algorithm some, somewhere without, actually, you don't need to understand the algorithm. And it, that's great in the same way how I don't need to understand a compiler to be able to use a compiled language. I think it's great that people don't have to understand the algorithms anymore, but just be careful because most of the mess comes from the data. So ask questions about the data, try out corner cases, try out outliers, try to break the system to find how it's behaving in these weird sort of cases. So just be careful. And thank you. <laughs>